Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway. Today I'm going to be doing a comparison between the two major double O gauge locomotive manufacturers, those of course being Hornby and Backman. Now in their time both of these manufacturers have made some amazing models and they've both kind of made some bad ones as well, but this video is going to give you a general idea of what you can expect from both. Most of today's video then is going to apply to Hornby and Backman's steam locomotives, although quite a lot of it will apply to their diesels and electrics as well. However, if this video does quite well and people like it, I might do another version for diesels and electrics, but today the emphasis is going to be mainly steam. So let's talk about the first category then, and that is build, the build. What are they made of? What are these different manufacturers making their models out of? Well, we'll start with Backman first of all, because they are quite consistent in the build materials of their models. So as I say, yeah, Backman are quite consistent. They tend to use just plastic bodies on their locomotives with die cast running boards. There are some exceptions, but they are quite reliable in this trend. The running plates then are normally where most of the weight for Backman's models come from, and the bodies tend to make up most of the weight, with the chassis themselves being quite light, and there are quite a few examples of these. The E1, for example, is one of those, the Webb Coal Tank. Quite a lot of their modern stuff does have quite a light chassis and quite a heavy body. Great in general, of course, the weights are usually pretty good. However, if you want to use the chassis for something else, that can be a little bit of a problem. The major exception to this trend is the older Backman split chassis locos. In those days, it was definitely the chassis that brought most of the weight to the locos. The bodies here tended to be mainly plastic, but these days they tend to have the die cast running plates, which is great. Now, talking about Hornby in the same category, they're much, much less consistent. Many of their models, uh, particularly the larger ones, tend to have just plastic bodies. That goes for most of the Great Western fleet, so you pick any of their Great Western 460 tender engines, they're all gonna have plastic bodies. Same goes with most of their tank engines as well, and larger engines, so you've got the A4s, the A3s, uh, any of the LNER stuff really. But these locos are rarely light because they tend to have big chunky chassis which do make up most of the weight and some good examples there are the p2 very light and flimsy body but the chassis weighs an awful lot making the p2 one of the most powerful and heavy locos same thing goes with the latest princess royal quite a light body not very much metal work on there but they tend to use big heavy chassis which is fair enough like I say though, Hornby are quite inconsistent where this is concerned because some of their smaller tender engines and some of their shunting engines and maybe little diesels, they tend to have a lot of die cast on them. Yes, the running plate, but also the bodies as well. So here are a few of them and there are quite a lot actually that have all metal boilers and running plates and that kind of thing. The J36 is a major one, a lot of metal work on that. The Adams radial tank had loads of metal, the J15 again, largely metal, and it's not all smaller engines as well. You've got locos like the B12 and the D16, they tend to have metal bodies as well, or largely metal bodies, the cabs sometimes aren't. In my opinion, these are some of Hornby's best locos, and the price doesn't seem to shoot up for their die cast models either, which is quite impressive. And because the prices tend to be similar, it's hard to tell which of these models have the die cast and which of them don't. And then of course, sometimes, if Hornby are having a bad day, you end up with locos that have a light chassis and a light body, as you can see here. Uh, which just results, in my opinion, in a fairly useless loco. I mean, those Lord Nelsons, for example, those were supposed to be incredibly powerful machines in real life. The model, incredibly light. But there we go, that's just a little bit about build. Let's move on then and talk a little bit about the detail. Now we'll start with Backman again, who once again are quite consistent. Generally speaking, their models are very, very high spec, and sometimes they even throw in really nice extras, such as opening smoke box doors, a feature we very rarely see from Hornby, which is quite nice. Generally, most of their locos have painted cabs. Uh, most of them are pretty good as well. They tend to go the whole hog and do the wooden floor effect if that's applicable to the loco, which is really nice to see. They sometimes do omit popular features such as sprung buffers, which we've seen a few times, which can be a bit confusing given the price. But generally speaking, the level of detail on a Backman loco is going to be good, provided it's reasonably modern. The decoration is usually excellent as well. It's not always the case with Backman's older models, as you can see with the J72. But unless you've got a model that's got like a, a factory hiccup on it or something, the decoration is going to be quite good. On the subject of Hornby and detail then, it's a little bit more complicated. I think the main reason for this is because Hornby continue to produce some older models which don't have the high spec. But generally speaking, Hornby's new stuff does have a great level of detail, although they rarely throw in the flashy extras such as the opening smoke box. 
You do have to be quite careful with Hornby though because they do tend to try and pass off these older, more basic models as modern railways range stuff, uh, which is a little bit misleading sometimes and the prices don't always reflect that lack of detail. So a few to look out for are on the screen right now. A few of the classics are the 2P, for example, the 4F, those are X mainline Dapple toolings, I believe. And those models are usually a little bit underwhelming. Hornby's trends are also further complicated by their sort of design clever phase, which I always say wasn't particularly clever. Basically, that's a sneaky way of saying that they still cost a lot to buy, but the spec is generally lower. So the design clever locos tend to have no sprung buffers. They tend to have a lot of molded details, unpainted cabs, and there were quite a few examples of those in Hornby's range. The Duke of Gloucester, the Class 8, that's one of them. A lot of the Great Western tank engines, the 72XX, the 52XX, very, very basic. The P2 is another one, beautiful models, but quite basic. Unfortunately, a lot of Hornby's design clever locos are not labeled as such, so it's difficult to know. So it's worth doing some research before you buy models from Hornby, that's for sure. If it's top of the range and they've pulled out all of the stops, so the level of detail is normally really, really impressive, as you will know if you've seen any of my reviews. Decoration, where home is concerned, when they get it right, is normally absolutely fantastic. It can sometimes be a little bit more hit and miss though. Sometimes we have messy paintwork as you can see here. Sometimes their choice of paint is a little bit poor as well for some of the printed details. I remember on Hornby's Lord Nelson, some of the printed details, such as the builder's plates and such, didn't look quite right. And they do that quite often. I mean, the J36 mod was a bit like that as well. So something to look out for. Also, sometimes if you're unlucky, Hornby's locos do tend to have a few glue marks where they haven't been assembled that tidily in the factory. Occasionally, they are victims of sloppy assembly. Say all you like about the quality of Backman's models by design, but generally speaking, the way Backman models are assembled is usually top-notch. It's very rare that you actually see a messy glue mark on a Backman Loco. Next up then, let's talk about one of my favourite categories, and that is mechanism. Now, for a lot of Backman's very most recent releases, the mechanisms have been better, but in general, for the most part, for most of their range, Backman's mechanisms are poorer than Hornby's, in my opinion. They fairly consistently use three-pole motors instead of five-pole ones, and they tend to use their sort of own design. I mean, a lot of the time with Hornby, you can find replacements on eBay, which don't cost very much money. I've actually never been able to do that with Backman's standard motor, which means if you have any failures and they do happen quite often in my experience at least you have to go to Backman to get the replacements which isn't particularly good. As you can see here they also rarely use flywheels most of their motors are just literally motor worm gear straight to the gear train no flywheels of any kind which isn't particularly great. I would say they very rarely fit the proper metal bearings onto their axles of their steam locos. A lot of their new releases do, that's worth saying, but for most of their range that is not the case, which is confusing because Hornby have been doing this as standard for around 20 years now. I don't know whether it's because of that or just because of the motors that a lot of Backman's locos seem to be a little bit underpowered, but I do tend to notice on quite a few Backman locos that they do slow down and struggle around curves, which could be due to increased friction in the mechanism because of the lack of proper metal bearings. One thing is for sure, that's not something I see very often with Hornby. Next up, most of Backman's locomotives do not have any tender pickups if they're tender locos. Those that do have quite flimsy pickups, as you can see, and they only cover four of the wheels usually as well. They're just little brass wipers that sort of bend up and touch the axles. They're not that reliable, and because of the way a lot of the tenders are assembled, the tender to loco wires tend to foul those as well. Not particularly good. And as I say, there are a lot of Backman locos that just don't have tender pickups at all, which is quite unfortunate actually, because a lot of the time, tender pickups allow a loco to run much more reliably, particularly over points and that sort of thing. And to put that into perspective for you, here are my modern Backman locos that do not have tender pickups. And this is not even all of them. I've left out any sort of class duplicates I have. 19, I make that in total. And here are all my Backman locos that do have tender pickups, again, excluding any duplicates. There's about 10, which is about a third of all my Backman locos. Not a great track record, really. And yes, they are all that flimsy type that just touches the axles. Yeah, a much higher proportion of Hornby's locos have tender pickups, which are better quality, too. Hornby's mechanisms are generally much, much better, and they have been for the last 20 years or so. It's very, very rare to find a Hornby locomotive that doesn't have the proper metal bearings on the wheel sets, and that goes for even the most basic, cheapest Hornby railroad locos, such as the Jinties. There are a few exceptions to this. Some of Hornby's cheaper railroad locos don't have those, and a lot of their design clever locos, again, I mean, this doesn't make any sense to me, but a lot of those don't have them either. So you've got the P2, no proper bearings there, the Duke of Gloucester, nothing like that. 
Some of them even have square bearings, which is a little bit naff. Some of their 460 tender engines from the Great Western don't have them as well. I believe the Star Class is one of them. So you've got to watch out for it. I, I don't know why they decided to make their models deliberately naff like that. But for the most part, and certainly any of the new stuff that Hornby bring out, you're going to see the proper metal bearings there, which is great. Hornby also use five pole motors much more often than Backman do. Some models are still fitted with three pole motors on, I know the Drummond 700 class, their Terriers are, so it's not a 100% pass rate, but they certainly use more five pole motors than Backman do. And they often use flywheels as well, which does provide much smoother running. And again, that is true of a lot of Hornby railroad locos as well. The Tornadoes are one of the massive flywheels on those. Promotes really, really smooth running, which is great. Hornby sometimes do try to get away with shoddy motors though, I mean we've got that M-type motor I believe it is, or is it a Type 7? I'm not entirely sure, they might be one and the same thing, but the 14XX has got a shoddy motor in it, uh, they're only three pole motors and they do have a tendency to burn out, I've actually seen it happen quite a few times. There are models such as the Hornby H-Class as well, I don't know if it's the motors that are strictly to blame for those issues, but a lot of people have told me about the motors failing in those, and indeed mine failed quite a few times as well, it's now on Motor 3 I believe. So yeah, so Sometimes the motors aren't spot on and if you look around on YouTube you will see the same old culprits popping up with motor issues. I know the S15 was one. I don't know what it is but sometimes Hornby motors can be a little bit unreliable and prone to failure. For the most part though, particularly with the top of the range stuff, you're going to see good motors. And the great thing is they use sort of standard size motors so if you want to you can do some shopping and find replacements as I have done in the past. Check out the video if you want to see that. Finally then, where Hornby are concerned with mechanisms, we have the tenders. Now I would say 95% of the time, if a Hornby Loco has got a tender, it will have tender pickups. And they're not just naff little pickups that are there just so that they can say that they're there. Generally speaking, they're proper pickups, just like on the Loco, which go to each of the wheels and actually provide some practical level of support to the electrical connection to the Loco, which means that a lot of Hornby's Locos are much more reliable. Now, as always, there are some exceptions to that rule. I mean, some of Hornby's railroad Locos, the latest 9Fs, for instance, didn't have any tender pickups. The B17 was one. But for the most part, Hornby are really, really good for including tender pickups, which for me is a great plus. Finally then, on to one of my very favourite topics of conversation, possibly even more so than mechanisms, that is the price. Now, just like with every other category, there is quite a lot of variation between the two manufacturers here, but there is a clear trend overall, at least in my opinion. And that is that generally speaking, not always, as I say, but generally speaking, Backman's Locos are much more expensive than Hornby's, often without justification. And to demonstrate this, I've got some examples for you. So if we kick off with an 060 tender engine, we have the Backman J72 or E1, which has an RRP of £129.95 versus the Hornby J50, which is a similarly specced, very high quality, much heavier and better quality mechanismed locomotive, I would say, which has an RRP of just £93.99. So we've got about £35 more expensive on Backman there. That is more than just a few percent, isn't it? Let's move on then to 060 tender engines. We've got the Backman C-Class, which is priced at £199.95, versus the J36 from Hornby, which is a similar 060 tender engine, with an RRP of £139.99. 99. Bear in mind here that the J36 is much higher spec, much newer than the C-Class, and it has a lot more die cast and a much better mechanism than the C-Class. I think the 060 tender engines is an area where Backman really fall down on price, unfortunately. Let's take a look at a random 460 tender engine. I went with the Backman Jubilee, which is £179.95 on the RRP, versus the Hornby Royal Scott, which is £170.99, so Backman are still £10 more. I can't really make a fair comparison there because I don't have a Hornby Royal Scott, but the Backman Jubilee doesn't have a great mechanism. It's got that three-pole motor, no flywheel, no proper bearings, no tender pickups on mine. Seems a lot of money for a loco with such a poor mechanism, but they are beautiful, as you can see here. Let's have a look at some Pacifics then, some 462 tender engines. You've got the Backman A1, which now has an RRP of £199.95, quite an old model now as well, it's been around for a while. And then let's take a look at, let's say, the Hornby A2-3, which has been announced, not yet released, RRP of £189.99, which is £10 less than Backman. Bear in mind, though, where the Hornby Pacifics are concerned, you tend to have an all-plastic body, whereas with Backman you do tend to get a bit of die-cast, so bear that in mind. 
Here's one for the diesel fans though, we've got the Backman 08 shunter, which is priced at £124.95 RRP, versus, here's a surprise, the Hornby, which is priced at £145.99. So Hornby are £21 more. Again, I don't know what the comparison is between the two because I don't own a super detailed Hornby 08, but that's one of the few examples where a Hornby loco is actually more expensive than an equivalent Backman loco. But generally speaking, I would say Backman are much more expensive. If you disagree, and if you've got some more examples perhaps that demonstrate otherwise please do let me know down in the comments for now though those are some of my thoughts on the two major manufacturers of british double o gauge locomotives if you've got any other thoughts and observations things i missed things that i covered that you agree or disagree with please do let me know down in the comments because i love having these discussions for now though i hope you enjoyed that thank you so much for watching have a great day and i will see you very soon all right cheers folks take care